Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Coming up tonight in our news, the government granted leave to appeal a citizenship ruling. COVID-19 cases at the National Reference Lab halt testing. Plus, a man found dead in a car with the engine running. Welcome to Our News and thank you for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. Top of news tonight, the Royal Bahamas Defense Force officer accused of the 2019 murder at Government House was found not guilty on all five counts today. Able Seaman Javon Seymour was accused of murdering Petty Officer Percival Perpal while he was on the job at 3 a.m. on April 28, 2019. He was also accused of attempting to murder two other Defense Force officers at the time. Seymour's attorney, Muriel DeSeal, argued that the evidence just didn't point to his client, particularly DNA evidence. The nine-member, all-woman jury didn't take long to return with the not guilty verdict, acquitting Seymour of one count of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of possession of a firearm with the intent to endanger life. While the Court of Appeal has granted the government leave to appeal to the Privy Council, its decision to uphold a landmark ruling on citizenship. The issue of stay, however, has been adjourned to July 14th. Last week, the Court of Appeal, in a 3-2 decision, affirmed a ruling by Supreme Court Justice Ian Winder that every person born in the Bahamas will become a citizen of the Bahamas at their date of birth if either parent is a citizen of the Bahamas, irrespective of their marital status. The government argues that the majority of the Court of Appeal erred in not recognizing the intention of the framers of the Constitution in not giving the right to citizenship at birth to every person born in the Bahamas after July 9, 1973. While the matter is adjourned, Queen's Counsel Wayne Monroe, who represents the respondents, will be at liberty to file affidavit evidence. Franklin Williams, who represents government, will be allowed to make further submissions. In other news, a father of four was shot and killed during an incident off Lion Road early this morning. Jared Hayes has the story. I love you. The man who was gunned down early Wednesday morning is 40-year-old Marvin Roll, according to his grieving aunt. When I saw him going here at 1 o'clock, not knowing that that was his death he's going into. According to police, it was around 1 a.m. when officers were alerted to gunshots in the Lion Road area. Responding officers met Roll slouched over in the driver's seat of a white Nissan Cube in the middle of the street with the engine still running. Paramedics pronounced him dead on scene. When our news visited the scene later on Wednesday morning, Blood stains were visible in the road. I had a brother die from gunshot wound, June 5th, on my 50th birthday. Now today, there is my nephew on his 40 years, going through the same pain. His grieving aunt, Karen Roll, broke down in tears over her nephew, who she described as a loving man who was improving his life. She says he was the father of four teenagers and owned fishing boats and had a car rental business. Anybody that know Marvin know the type of person that he is, a loving and a caring person. He's just, he's just a person of life. You understand? He has himself and now. But in spite of his challenges, he still tried to live that life, what, you know, a pleasing life that is pleasing to God. You understand? He has a little ups and downs, like I say, but no, nobody perfect. Roll says she's the closest family to her nephew. He was raised by his grandmother as his mother struggled with drugs throughout her life and his father wasn't present. The effects of gun violence leaving the 54-year-old reeling as she remembers her brother being killed just feet away from where we interviewed her. She says she hoped for different for her nephew. Got his own business, tried to live right and do right. According to our news records, Roll's killing was the 56th homicide for 2021. There have been seven murders in 13 days, consistent with the higher rate of killings officials have noticed throughout the year. Reporting for Our News, I'm Jared Higgs. Well, Tourism Minister the UNAC Diagler revealing the government will take steps to secure the property that provides access to Cabbage Beach if the matter is not resolved. In fact, he said officials have sought legal advice. Bertha McDermott reports. If the owners of the property leading to Cabbage Beach refuse to provide public access to the beach, then government will have to exercise its right to eminent domain and secure the property, according to Tourism Minister Dionisio de Aguilar. So now it, the government has to act assertively. I mean, if they refuse to do anything, the only option then left to the government is to exercise its right of eminent domain 
and to secure that property. Earlier this month, Cabbage Beach vendors met the Paradise Island Beach entrance locked and their items outside when they returned to work. This prompted the disgruntled group to forcefully open the gate. At the time, Diagola said he was blindsided by the move. Officials are now seeking advice of the Attorney General's office on the matter. They are digesting the fact that um, the vendors and Bahamians in general uh, want an access to that beach and I am being led to believe that they're going back to contemplate how to embrace and incorporate that request into their project. The property is owned by Access Industry and according to the Aguilar, plans are in the works to develop a condo hotel. He also took a jab at the former Christie administration, insisting the matter should have been addressed when the deal was made. What I find really troubling, however, is that when that project, when that property was sold from Atlantis to Access, that the government of the day, the PLP, didn't deal with that matter then. That would have been the ideal time to say, okay, as a condition of the sale, create an access point for the public. Because unfortunately, the court has ruled that is private property. Reporting for Our News, I'm Bertha McDermott. COVID-19 cases at the National Reference Lab forcing officials to halt COVID-19 testing at the facility and move operations, according to Health Minister Edward Walz. As it currently stands, we've had a number of uh, COVID positives inside the National Reference Lab. Um, and as it stands now, our National Reference Lab uh, as I understand it, is not doing COVID tests. Uh, we have now moved um, all of the COVID the RT-PCRC testing to Doctors Hospital, and uh, we'll also be uh, doing testing at PMH, uh, where we have both the gene expert machine, the biofire, and the panther machine, all that can do COVID testing. Well, stressed that the arrival of other COVID-19 variants like the Delta variant is imminent. He said officials are currently conducting contact tracing and he anticipates the facility will be down for at least 14 days. We will still be able to get the results out. Uh, as I said, we will and we have already engaged Doctors Hospital as well as PMH um, has the facility to be able to do testing as well as our facilities in Grand Bahama. The RAN does have a gene expert machine to test in uh, Grand Bahama as well. Um, we're also able to do limited amount of testing at South Beach. I believe we were supposed to be getting the cover for the facility at South Beach. But we do have the requisite uh, equipment and personnel in place to, to continue with our uh, testing capabilities. A one-month-old baby who was admitted to Princess Margaret Hospital's children's ward on Friday and subsequently transferred to the intensive care unit experienced an intravenous infiltration resulting in injuries, according to the Public Hospital's authority. PHA officials said in a statement the IV infiltration is a common complication during IV therapy. The hospital said its executive management and clinical teams have met with the infant's fa immediate family, adding he continues to receive specialized care for his condition. Well, more rainy days ahead. Meteorologist Greg Thompson has the first look. Thanks, Kyle, and welcome everybody for your first look at weather. Very warm and humid evening setting up outside our studios. Temperatures in the low 80s, 81 degrees outside our studios right now under partly cloudy skies with some showers around isolated thunderstorms in the far distance. Call it humid, southeast winds at around 6 knots and your feels like temperature in the upper 80s. That disturbance that was east of the islands now moving towards the west, spreading showers and thunderstorms across the Bahamas. We will continue to see that action tonight through tomorrow. So keep your umbrellas handy for some showers and thunderstorms. That's your first look at weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. Still to come, 191,000 people registered to vote so far. Plus, Pajo raises cruise travel concerns. Stay with us. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID-19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID-19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. watching our news welcome back if an election were to be called tomorrow the parliamentary registration department would be ready to smoothly carry out the process according to acting parliamentary commissioner Lovato Duncanson who says the department has seen a jump in those seeking to register 
The amount that is required is ready to go. The acting parliamentary commissioner says the department has ballot boxes in excess and that if an election were to be called tomorrow, the department would be ready. According to Duncanson, 191,000 people are registered to vote, the largest age bracket of people coming in to get registered between the ages of 26 and 35. Persons aged 18 to 25, there was approximately 15. 1,457 persons would have been added to the register in that grouping. Mm -hmm. Persons 26 to 35, uh, there was approximately 33,447 persons added to the register, and that's what I spoke to a few minutes ago. That age group that is 26 to 35, mm -hmm. uh, that is the largest amount of persons who would have been added to the register since 2017. Last week, Attorney General Carl Bethel said there had been an influx of people seeking to get registered after the Court of Appeal upheld a ruling that says anyone born in the Bahamas to a Bahamian parent is entitled to citizenship, regardless of either parent's marital status. But Duncanson says since voter registration began, there have been those who may not be eligible to vote showing up in an attempt to register. And it is during that interview process where it is determined whether or not the individual who presents themselves has sufficient documentary evidence to support that this individual is a citizen of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Duncanson says there have been instances of people living in the same house, but in two different constituencies. As there is now a permanent register, the department is asking those individuals, as well as those who have moved over the past three months, to come in and get registered in their new constituency. If you've lost your voter's card, if your voter's card has been displaced, we will encourage individuals to have that matter reported to a police station, present the police report to the Parliamentary Voter Registration Department so that we are able to issue a replacement voter's card. Well, as tourism officials push for a full rebound of the nation's number one industry, a Pan American Health Organization official is sending a stern warning about summer travel for countries with low vaccination rates like the Bahamas. Jasmine Brown has more. Addressing the issue of tourism, dependent country is welcoming the resumption of summer travel with Pan American Health Organization Director Dr. Carissa Etienne. Given the significant gaps in vaccine coverage and the still imminent risk of infection, now may not be the ideal time for travel, especially in places with active outbreaks or where hospital capacity may be limited. Dr. Etienne added that more families are likely choosing to travel over the next few weeks, and it's clear tourism-dependent countries are looking to benefit from an influx of visitors. That has been the case here in the Bahamas, where Tourism Minister Dionisio de Aguilar has continued to tout an increase in visitor arrivals. As you can see tourism is bouncing back. The numbers are very robust. Atlantis was at 90% this weekend. Bahama was at 75 to 80%. And we've been keeping the COVID numbers low. Vaccinating residents has been one of the government's key reasons for loosening restrictions across the country. The Bahamas government requires all people entering the country from abroad to either be fully vaccinated or to have tested negative for COVID-19 by way of a PCR test within five days of arrival. But Dr. Etienne warned that vaccinations are not a free pass. We must remember, however, that while vaccines protect us from the worst of this virus, even those who are vaccinated can become sick and spread. Baha officials warn that more transmissible variants like the Delta variant have been spreading through travel. However, officials have assured that this variant has not yet been detected in the Bahamas. According to the latest Ministry of Health statistics, only 12 percent of the adult population of the Bahamas is vaccinated. Paho officials said in Wednesday's press conference that countries should aim for a 70% vaccination rate in order to reach herd immunity. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Well, with a second cruise line days away from setting sail from New Providence, Pan American Health Organization officials urge countries like the Bahamas to proceed with caution as much is still unknown about the spread of COVID-19 on cruise ships. The assuming cruise ships traffic requires the utmost utmost caution because the dynamic of the spread of the virus on cruise ships is still not fully understood. So the countries that are receiving cruise ships, cruise ships in, in, in their, on their shores uh, must be cautious for the importation, early detection, but also on the potential spread of the virus among the community. 
After more than a year of no cruise ship activity, the first ship to homeport in the Bahamas, Royal Caribbean International's Adventure of the Seas, which was also the cruise line's first ship to resume cruising in the Western Hemisphere, left Nassau's cruise port early this month with more than 1,000 passengers. While all passengers older than 16 were required to be fully vaccinated, last week it was confirmed that two passengers on the ship, who were both unvaccinated and younger than 16, had tested positive for COVID-19. Agarte said it's vital for countries welcoming cruise passengers to minimize the risk of local spread of COVID-19. Further uh, spread cannot be eliminated. It can be reduced. So in that regard, uh, authorities must have put in place measures to minimize the risk of local spread by early detection, as we said, isolation of suspected cases, quarantine of contacts, and, and also early treatment of, of the patients. A 19-year-old man facing several charges today, including murder. Lovato Dean, seen in the plaid shirt, was charged with the June 20th murder of Reno Rankine and possession of a firearm with the intent to endanger the life of Vandalin Pyfram Oldham. According to the police report, a gunman pulled up at the victim's home on Sydney Street, Chippingham, and shot him several times following a struggle. The Foxhill teen was also charged with the attempted murder of Michael Gibson and an armed robbery on June 21st. He allegedly robbed Tiffany Gibson at gunpoint of her gray Nissan Note. Dean was not required to enter a plea and was remanded until September 23rd. Still to come, star athletes talk Tokyo Olympics. The details when our news returns. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID-19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID-19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. This is Our News. Welcome back. The return of cruise passengers having some trickle-down effects for our key vendors who say more customers have been sailing in. Jillian Gray has more. Very excited. Yeah. <laughs> the popular hangout spot for tourists and locals alike is buzzing once again. Our wacky vendors say they've seen an uptick in business not only from cruise passengers, but also because of the relaxation of curfew hours. Most of our summer guests are mostly coming from the cruise ships. And as for the home porting, we see a little uptick at times when the boat is in. You know, but it's not like when the major cruise ships are here during the, during the regular season, no. Even with the extension on the, the extra hour, you know what I mean, a lot of tourists is coming and is flocking. I wouldn't say business is back the usual, but um, business is definitely on the way. It's moving forward. The shutdown of the tourism industry last year brought the social hub to a virtual standstill. For Dario Williams down at Joey's Seafood Restaurant, more business means he can now bring more staff back to work. Give God thanks. You know, it's a blessing and we're making some, some money. It's now finally paid a bit. Stall owners aren't the only ones who've benefited from the influx of tourists in the last several weeks. Taxi cab drivers say this is the most business they've seen in a long time. It, it seems to be picking up, um, according to what the other drivers are saying, it's picking up gradually. The 35-year taxi veteran says while he's looking forward to the new cruise port being open so that even more business can come, he's not happy about weekly testing for drivers nor COVID vaccinations. I really ain't into taking these COVID every week because, you know, that's what the drivers have to do. Every week they have to be taking the tests. I'm going to see what's happening first because I don't have no intentions of taking the vaccine. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. Two of the country's Olympic medal hopefuls talk preparations for Tokyo. Marcellus Hall has more in sports. All right, thanks a lot. Welcome to our sports, everybody. I'm Marcellus Hall. The Olympic Games are not so far away. In fact, they'll come your way towards the end of this month. In that regard, we just had our B3H track and field nationals, as a lot of our top athletes were in action trying to put up some qualifying times or simply to round themselves back into shape. One of those, Shawnee miller Weibo. Defending Olympic gold medalist in the 400 meters, Shawnee Miller-Weibo, putting her talents on display this past weekend. This at the B3A track and field nationals. Miller-Weibo, who ran in both the 400 meters and here in the 200 meters, talked about rounding back into shape after a slight injury and getting back ready for Tokyo. Uh, like I said, you know, 
just trying to get back into shape. I'm um, trying to get some races under my belt and just go from there. But yeah, everything is shaping up into the right direction. And yeah, we're going to be ready for when the, when the games come. Uh, well, you know, I feel, I feel pretty good right now. Um, we just started training back again about two weeks ago. And so, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm feeling better. And like I said, we're just trying to build as much as we can to be ready. As for world champion in the 400 meters, Stephen Gardner, he was on the track as well as a member of the men's 4x400 meter team. As they said about the business of trying to qualify to run that event at the Olympics in July. Gardner saying he felt pretty good about the squad's chances to get in. I feels good, you know. We had the, for the past two days, we had the Open 400. And with the Sunday, we just had to qualify the team. So hopefully we get in and... We take a team to Tokyo. All right, so there you are. Check on sports for you here on this Wednesday. I'm Marcellus Hall. Back to you. Meet the winners of this year's Laws of Life essay competition right after this break. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID-19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID-19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. Welcome back to Our News. Well, as you start making weekend plans, Greg is back to tell us what weather conditions you can expect. Thanks again, Kyle, and welcome back, everybody, for your second look at weather. Well, we are sandwiched between two disturbances, one in the Gulf of Mexico that's pumping some tropical moisture across the area, the other one a low to mid-level disturbance to the east of the islands, translating towards the west. That will keep us in a wet pattern for the next couple of days as lots of showers and thunderstorms associated with that system continues to push towards the west. Tropical wave now moving through the Windward Islands. Not really concerned about that 20% chance for some development as it continues to move towards the west. But this is the one that we're going to continue to monitor. National Hurricane Center giving that a 70% chance. All models are indicating the system should stay to the south of the Bahamas. But we will continue to monitor these systems as it pushes towards the west. Let's look now at your boating forecast for the northwest and central Bahamas tonight through tomorrow. Your winds will be east to south, east at around 15 knots. Seas running 3 to 5 feet over the ocean. While in the southeast Bahamas, we still have the caution flag posted for you guys down there. East to southeast, silly winds, 15 to 20 knots. Seas choppy, 4 to 6 feet. Low tide will be at 7.32 tonight. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your extended forecast through Monday. That's a look at our weather, a wet pattern for us, so make sure you keep your umbrellas handy. Back to you, Kyle. After combing through 2,000 essays, 34 students from primary to college level were awarded over $10,000 in scholarships and prizes in the Laws of Life competition. Video competition winners Celine Ferguson and Velia Roll said while their video presented some logistical challenges, they were happy that their story of positivity won them the cash prize of $1,000. It was easy because of our chemistry, and when we thought of it, we were able to kind of manipulate our video idea to our real life. Telling the story of not giving up, that despite there might be so much negative in your life, you can always find some type of positive and focus on the positive and go for it. For her essay on the law of life, joy is not in things, but is in you, Tata Morrison was awarded a cash prize of $700, a $1,000 scholarship, and a $1,000 cash prize for her school. Both she and Queens College student Daniel Bonaby shared what went into writing a great essay. I don't let negativity affect me, and I was able to draw on that as inspiration to write my essay. They see the laws of life, things that are more important than just materials, and so I think it will help them to mature mentally in that aspect. So it, it's not all about the prizes, but it's about personal development as well. So go ahead and give it a try. Well, thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Kyle Joaquin. We will see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a good evening, Thomas.